The next stage is coming, says Israel's Prime Minister. An attack on Gaza by air, sea and land. War in Israel and Gaza, the worst attack on the Jewish state in 50 years. With over 1,300 Israelis killed by Hamas. We won't break. Israel won't break. More than 2,200 people have been killed in Gaza since Israel launched retaliatory airstrikes. While Israel is preparing for a possible ground incursion, and Palestinian civilians warn of a humanitarian crisis. There's no safe places now in Gaza. All Gaza under attack, all Gaza under bombing. British politicians have made clear they stand with Israel. Israel has every right to defend itself and take the action that is necessary to ensure protection and security of its citizens. Israel has every right to defend herself. And the perpetrators of this have deliberately pushed back the prospect of peace agreement. Some have also urged restraint. Yes, they are going too far. Collective punishment cannot be justified. So we have one question this morning. What happens next in the Israel-Hamas war? We'll be asking Mark Regev, senior advisor to the Israeli Prime Minister, about what Israel is planning to do. We'll hear from Ambassador Hussam Zomlot, head of the Palestinian mission to the UK. The Foreign Secretary, James Cleverly, is back from Israel this week and joins us live. The SNP leader, Humza Yousaf, has family trapped in Gaza. He joins us from Aberdeen, where his party conference is about to begin. For Labour, we have David Lammy, who wants to be Foreign Secretary if Labour win the next general election. Good morning and welcome to our panel this morning. We have Sir Malcolm Rifkind, Conservative former Foreign Secretary, Bronwyn Maddox, CEO of an independent think tank on international affairs, Chatham House, and Danny Sriskandaraja, Chief Executive of Oxfam GB, who has a team of 33 in Gaza. And we will be hearing from all of you after we've had an update on the situation in Israel and Gaza. Gaza is braced for an air, sea and land attack after Israel says the next stage is coming. The UN says nearly a million Palestinians have fled their homes after Israel warned them to evacuate the northern Gaza Strip ahead of that ground offensive against Hamas. Israel says it wants to eliminate Hamas after the brutal massacre just over a week ago where babies, children, mums, dads, grandparents were murdered and around 150 hostages were kidnapped, including its reported British people. 1,300 Israelis have been killed. And after a week of retaliatory airstrikes in Gaza, more than 2,300 Palestinians have been killed. On Friday, at least 12 people fleeing an evacuation route out of Gaza City were hit by an airstrike, with children among the dead. It's now eight days since Hamas, which is classified as a terrorist organisation by many Western governments, including the UK, launched the worst attack on civilians in Israel's history. The government and Labour leader have both backed Israel's right to defend itself, saying the responsibility lies with Hamas. The World Health Organisation has today described Israel's evacuation order as a death sentence for those needing hospital treatment. Just before we came on air, I spoke to Mark Regev, senior advisor to Israel's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. I asked him first about Israel's coordinated attack by land, sea and air on Gaza and about the scale of what is to come. I think it's important for the viewers to understand that this is not another round of Israel-Hamas fighting. Uh, since Hamas took over the Gaza Strip 16 years ago, there have been four or five different rounds of fighting, uh, rockets fired into Israel, Israel responding. No, we're not there anymore. What happened on October 7th, uh, the, the massacre of our people, uh, um, uh, the single largest uh, uh, attack uh, of murder, of anti-Semitic violence 
since 1945, since the terrible years of the Holocaust, uh, this has changed the situation dramatically. And this is not another round of fighting. This is war. We didn't want this war. We were surprised by the attack and we are responding. And though we didn't want this conflict, we will win it. And at the end of this, it will end on our terms. I'm going to ask you about uh, the people in Gaza who were stuck there in just a moment. Let me ask you about the Israeli hostages. How confident are you with what is about to happen in Gaza of bringing those people home alive? Well, the first thing that has to be said is that the fact that they uh, kidnapped and took back to Gaza uh, uh, scores of people, uh, uh, over 120 hostages, uh, shows exactly who we're dealing with. A brutal, a horrific enemy that uses ISIS-type uh, tactics, uh, beheadings, uh, burning of bodies, uh, uh, shooting uh, little children, uh, babies in their cots riddled with bullets. These Hamas killers are capable of the worst sorts of violence. And we and are can responding you, can to can you that. bring them home alive? Well, w we hope to, obviously. Can I guarantee that? I, I cannot. I, I, uh, they're sitting in some underground dungeons in uh, Gaza. I have no idea how they're being treated. OK. I, uh, I can say this, though. Anyone who harms one of these hostages, we will find out, we will pursue them, and we will bring them to justice. I say to them, if you hurt any of our hostages, it might take a year, it might take 10 years, it might take 25 years, but you will be punished. Can I ask you what a land, sea and air assault means for the people, the Palestinian people who are trapped in Gaza? It's obviously very difficult for them. We've had to evacuate uh, people of, uh, across southern Israel because of the attacks, and uh, evacuating people is never easy, and in Gaza, even more so. Well, you'll know. That, is... I mean, you, you told over a million people to move from the north to the south, and the WHO says today f forcing hospital patients, for example, to relocate would be a death sentence. I mean, some of those people are not able to move. They are likely to die, aren't they? First of all, we're not going to target hospitals. Let's be, let's be clear here. Um, uh, even though in the past, uh, and it's been documented, Hamas has uses, used medical facilities, schools, even UN uh, uh, sites but, for their war machine. Sure, they but you, 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 can't, you can't guarantee that hospital patients, pregnant women, pregnant women babies are in ICU wards, won't be killed. You can't. There's no one can guarantee that. I wish I could. I wish I could make that promise. But in no conflict in modern history, Britain's been involved in wars in the Middle East, in Europe. I remember the bombing of Belgrade. When, when you're fighting a war, innocent people will get killed. Now, it's our obligation to keep those casualties to a minimum. What is important for responsible governments to do is to keep those casualties to a minimum. And okay, that's well, why it, we've as asked... you know, it's 1,300 Israeli people who've died so far, and it's over 2,000 Palestinian people who've died so far. Let me put this to you, Mr. Regev. Israel has had enormous sympathy and support after the brutal massacre last Saturday and the kidnappings. You risk losing that now, don't you, if you haven't lost it already? The most important thing for us is to destroy the Hamas military machine, the sort of people who inflicted the violence that we saw perpetrated against our, our citizens. And we will destroy the Hamas military machine. As people have been leaving, women and young children are being killed as a missile hits their vehicles as they head away from northern Gaza. And let me put this to you, senior UN figures have warned that some of Israel's actions could am amount to a breach of international humanitarian law, possibly even war crimes under international law. Do you accept that? I don't accept that. Israel works within the framework of international law, the rules of armed conflict, and by asking civilians to leave the territory, we're, we're making our effort to avoid 
civilian casualties. But as and one, I think that's as one, very... Sorry to, to uh, interrupt. As one former UN head of humanitarian affairs said, Jan Egeland, the Israeli order for civilians to move from north to south is impossible and illegal. It amounts to forcible transfers and a war crime. But she's also said there should be immediate ceasefire. And she's also said Israel can't target civilian areas where yeah. civilians are. Now, Hamas is only in civilian areas. Hamas has built its military infrastructure underneath urban areas. Uh, you talked about Jan Egerland. I think you may be mistaking them for someone else. Jan Egerland is a man, and so perhaps you've got oh, the, the quotes wrong. Um, I just want to, one last point, if I may, uh, to come back to the strike on the convoy of people as they were leaving northern Gaza. Earlier this morning on our sister programme, an IDF spokesperson said it was fake news. What do you say? Yes, yes, that is our information, uh, that this was staged by Hamas to discourage people from leaving. Israel does not target, does not target, I repeat, uh, non-combatants, innocent civilians. Well, our well, enemy that, that, is that, that, the Hamas. I mean, that, that, that can't be true because so many innocent civilians in Gaza have already died. I, I disagree. I disagree. Well, in two, every two, armed conflict... Over 2,000 is, 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 is not a large number and, what, they're not innocent civilians? First of all, those numbers are put out, out by the Hamas-controlled Ministry of Health. There's no distinction there between combatants and non-combatants. And I say to you openly, we want to kill, kill Hamas fighters. We want to kill the terrorists. That is our goal, to destroy Hamas's military capabilities. We want to come out of this in a different situation where Hamas no longer has military and political control over the Gaza Strip. We're going to smash their military machine and we're going to destroy their political structure. That is the goal of our operation. So if Hamas, Hamas terrorists are being killed, especially considering what they did just a few days ago to our people, that is justified self-defense. Now, we don't want to see civilians caught up in the crossfire between Israel and Hamas, but to say that Israel can't defend itself against these gruesome killers, uh, that's a bridge too far. That, that has no basis in serious international law. Mark Regev, thank you very much for talking to us this morning. Thank you. My pleasure. Let's talk now to the head of the Palestinian mission to the UK, Hussam Zomlot. He represents the Palestinian Authority, which runs parts of the Israeli-occupied West Bank and has no authority or influence in Gaza. Welcome to you. Good morning. Um, first of all, your response to what Mark Regev has just said on behalf of the Israeli government. I just hope the BBC will challenge this because this has gone on for a long time. He just claimed that Israel w did not and will not target hospitals. Yesterday, one of the major hospitals was bombarded. We have statements by the Archbishop, the Palestinian Archbishop of the Anglican Church, all the churches in Jerusalem and here in the UK condemning that act. These lies right live on camera that Israel sticks to the rules of international law. Seriously? cutting food, electricity, targeting schools, churches, mosques, cutting off people from any sort of humanitarian assistance is the contours of international law. Does Mark Regev really know what international law is? Does he know that it is the responsibility of his government and his military to protect the lives of the civilians? I haven't seen images of fighters, Hamas fighters being killed. All the images we are receiving are families being slaughtered. Can you tell me what you're hearing from family in Gaza, friends and contacts? What is the situation like there now? Horror, horror, carnage. People, you know what? Not only the people who are sitting in their home like my own family and then boom, they're dead. The father, the mother, the children, the grandmother, everybody like my own family. I'm talking about real experience here. But people who, for instance, have diabetes and now not only they don't have insulin, they don't have refrigerators to bought their medicine. My sister lives in the south of Gaza. Her home has a capacity for seven. You know how many people now live with her? 150. 150. In one house? They sleep standing. No food, no electricity, complete blackout, no supplies. They're sitting ducks, but they're showing human Solidarity, together, they sleep two hours and rounds. The people are absolutely showing that courage. 
This is carnage. And Israel claims on your program that they respect the provision of international law. And this is not the first time. OK. You are in mourning, like so many families. Uh, your own party, Fatah, is opposed to Hamas, uh, who carried out the massacres last week. Mark Regev has just told us that he, the Israeli government, the Israeli troops, want to wipe out Hamas, eliminate them. This is war, he says. What do you think of that objective? There is no military solution to this. Israel tried it with us. With what Fatah. about the objective? Then? There is. The, 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 it, it's ridiculous. Israel has used what happened. But last it's time. ridiculous because it can't work, it's, it's, or it's ridiculous because you don't want them to wipe out Hamas. No, because it can't work. It can't work. But you, in principle, you no, would want Israel is, to wipe out Hamas, There is, there is, Hamas, there is right? no military solution to this, uh, Victoria. Victoria. No, please, please can I me. just be clear for you, our you, audience? You, you asked me. In you, principle, <clears throat> would you want them to wipe out Hamas? In principle, I would want them to wipe one thing their military occupation, their colonization, and why won't you their say besiegement it, of Gaza. That's what needs to wipe, be wiped out. And I, uh, I, I want to ask you, why won't uh, you say, in principle, you agree with Israel wanting to wipe out Hamas? Why would I want to say that? Because this is a political conflict, uh, Victoria. This is a political conflict. We have had many movements in the past. Fatah started the armed struggle, not Hamas, but then Fatah and the PLO that I represent came to the conclusion that political horizon, that commitment to international law, that nonviolence and negotiations is the way forward. We provided a path 30 years ago, and we have been committing until now. And look what Israel did over this 30 years. Can more I settlements, ask you, can I ask more you, settlements, as more as settler you... violence, less prospects for a two-state solution, more denial of our rights. And look at this fanatical government now, supremacist in everything, Let Kahanist. Me. You're asking me about Hamas. I, I do you know who you, sits in the Israeli government? I want to ask you about the Palestinian people in Gaza, know, if I Victoria, may. do you know Can who I sits in the Israeli government? The, 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 the Palestinian the, people in Gaza, do you know how much let, Hamas is supported by them? Let's not focus on a Snapchat here. Just no, last no, Saturday. I'm not focusing on a Snapchat. No, no, you are. You I'm are. asking you a question. You're, if you know, and if you can explain to our audience here in the UK, how much Hamas is supported by Palestinians in Gaza? Why, why didn't you bring me here when the Israeli finance minister in Paris only recently... Please, would you answer said, my question? No, no, this is the right question. This is the right question because there is so much asymmetry in the conversation. And I, really, the, really. I, I would like the, to ask you if you know how much support Hamas has in Gaza from Palestinian people. Well, from previous polls, from previous uh, uh, incidents, the majority of the people in Gaza uh, do not belong to political factions, and the, the, those who do, the majority of them are Fatih. That's okay. a fact. Okay, that, that's, that's a fact. That's good to hear. Thank you. Um, we have not much time left. Uh, in a moment, we'll hear from the UK Foreign Secretary. Um, earlier this week, he said, these indiscriminate killings, these murders, these kidnaps, these terrorist actions by Hamas should be condemned by the leadership of the Palestinian Authority, because otherwise there will be this perception that all Palestinians support Hamas, and they don't. How do you respond to that? Well, 22 Arab states only two days ago, including my government, condemned violence against civilians from all sides. I okay. represent that government. Victoria, but why didn't you uh, ask Mark Regev to condemn what his government is doing like that? Why didn't I... you use the word condemn for Mark Regev just a few seconds and ago? just in a few seconds. Why not, what Mr. Cleverly? The why ma ma the British government needs to stick to its own historic legal and political responsibilities and to stop giving uh, a green light for those fanatics in the Israeli government, supremacists who have used the occasion and the incident on Saturday to wage a war against the Palestinian people, not Hamas. Thank you very much. Thank you for being with us this morning. The Foreign Secretary, James Cleverly, was in Israel last week and he is here with us. He's here with us in a moment. The Foreign Secretary, James Cleverly, was in Israel last week. While there, he expressed solidarity with Israeli leaders and met survivors of the Hamas assault. At one point, he had to run for cover as air raid sirens went off, warning of incoming rocket fire. Uh, and let's talk to Mr Cleverly now. Good morning to you. Um, you just heard the Palestinian ambassador to the UK asking you and the British government not to, quote, give a green light to the Israeli government, to the supremacists in the Israeli government. What do you say to that? Well, whilst I was uh, in Israel, Prime Minister Netanyahu was forming a broader coalition uh, government in direct response to the terrorist atrocities that were perpetrated uh, in Israel. 
Um, and I have made clear both on my, uh, both during my trip to Israel and before and since that we recognize the Palestinian people are suffering because of the actions of Hamas, as well as Israelis with the most brutal uh, attack for, for, for decades, an unprecedented level of attack. So we are very, very clear that uh, Hamas are causing deaths and pains to Israelis as well as Palestinians. We now know that Israel says it's preparing to um, attack Gaza by air, sea and land. The scale of this is huge. A million civilians, as you know, were told to move from the north to the south of Gaza. How worried are you about Palestinians in Gaza right now? Well, of course. Of course, I look at the plight of the Palestinians in Gaza caused in very large part uh, by the decisions made by Hamas, where uh, water pipes, rather than being used to pump water around Gaza, are being turned into rockets to fire into Israel. This I'm has, asking you about how worried uh, about you are about them now with what's so, to come. So, so we have been working to support the Palestinian people both on the West Bank and in Gaza uh, for, for many, many, many years because we are worried about the Palestinian uh, people. The actions, the, the terrorist atrocity that Hamas perpetrated will cause more difficulty for the Palestinian people. Um, are you worried about them being bombed by Israel? Well, of course we're worried about the, the loss of life in Gaza. But, uh, but the point that I have made consistently, repeated by the Prime Minister and other world leaders, is Israel does have the right to defend itself and protect itself from terrorist attacks from Hamas coming out of uh, Gaza. And does that They mean... do have a duty to minimise uh, civilian casualties, and I've raised this in every conversation I've had with the Israeli government uh, about this issue. OK. Uh, so does that mean you will support Israel whether it breaks international humanitarian law or not? This country will stand by Israel. So we are absolutely committed to international humanitarian law. We'll always defend that. Uh, President Herzog... Uh, said to me privately, and he's now also said uh, publicly, that uh, Israel uh, respects and will abide by international law. Um, so what, the, so uh, what, in that case, then, have you, have you asked Israel, are you going to ask Israel to wait until the civilians have moved out of northern Gaza so this is and to allow humanitarian aid so this is, this is really, Have you asked that So question? this is a really, really important point. We have spoken, and in fact, I've had a series of phone calls uh, since the terrorist attacks, uh, trying to see what can be done to provide humanitarian support uh, for Gaza, uh, to allow evacuation through the Rafah crossing, incredibly difficult circumstances there. But it's really, really uh, important point. We are seeing Hamas telling Palestinians not to leave northern Gaza, despite the fact that Israel, both through social, communica uh, social media communications, through leaflet drops and through... Uh, the news channels. Even so, if they uh, tell them, no, but, no you, you, this is really important, they, no, Victoria. This is really important. So, so Israel and it's uh, Israel are saying you should leave northern Gaza for your own safety. Hamas is trying to prevent Palestinians from doing so but you because know. Hamas wants those civilians to be a human shield against uh, uh, Israel's actions. But even if the Palestinian people ignored what Hamas is saying and tried to move south to protect their families, their kids. They can't do it in the time, can they? I mean, what I'm asking you is, are you asking Israel, have you asked Israel, yes or no, to wait until those civilians have moved? So, the, so I haven't uh, asked that specific request. Because, are you going to? Because Hamas are trying to prevent people leaving northern Gaza, and that is the point. OK. And Let so, me... look, we do want, of course, we want to minimise uh, Palestinian casualties, we want to minimise uh, Israeli casualties, we want... Uh, everybody to respect civilians. But the real clear distinction is Israel are trying to get civilians out of danger. Hamas are trying to put civilians into danger. And that is a fundamental difference between the two. Right. Let me read you these quotes, if I may. This is from the EU's High Commissioner for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy. They say, uh, there it is, Israel has the right to defend itself, but it has to be done according to the right of international law, humanitarian law. Some decisions are against this international law. Then we've got the UN's High Commissioner for Human Rights, who says, the imposition of sieges that endanger the lives of civilians by depriving them of goods essential for their survival is prohibited under international humanitarian law. And one more. The General Secretary of the Norwegian Refugee Council, Jan Egerland, 
who was involved in the Oslo Accords, as you know, said the Israeli order for civilians to move from northern Gaza to the south is impossible and illegal. It amounts to forcible transfers and a war crime. Are they wrong? Well, uh, there are a number of uh, other quotes which you didn't show, which, which don't agree with them. Now, the, are the they wrong? So the interpretation of uh, international law is not, uh, I'm not a, I, I'm not a lawyer, um, uh, uh, but the UK's position on international law is, act, is absolutely unwavering. Well, what have your the, Foreign uh, Office lawyers so, said to So President Herzog has said he is, the, he is the head of state of Israel and he has said that Israel will abide by international and, law. And, this I'm, is something and I'm giving you raised... quotes from people yes, who, who already, who, who, who who already said they've broken international law and, and I'm be... asking what the British government position uh, is on that. And, have and they Vic broken international and Victoria, law? There'll be, there'll, be, there'll be other very, very well-informed and thoughtful voices that will disagree with that interpretation. Well, what's the British but government's the point, interpretation? But the point that I'm saying is the UK government is absolutely committed to the adherence of uh, international human law. And when, uh, uh, and when we see breaches of that, we raise that, including with uh, Israel. Now, the point... Ha the point are you is, saying you haven't seen breaches thus far? The point is the, the, the clear difference is from uh, statements coming from Israel saying that they respect and will abide by international humanitarian uh, law and Hamas, on the other hand, who are specifically targeting civilians, okay. specifically putting Palestinian civilians in harm's way, hiding their terrorist infrastructure in amongst civilian infrastructure. And the distinction is clear. OK, I must ask you about British citizens, those sure. who might be being held hostage uh, and therefore are trapped in Gaza and can't get out. What are you doing to get them out? Well, uh, I've been speaking with uh, the Egyptian authorities, with the Israeli authorities, uh, and also with uh, other leading uh, political voices uh, in the region to try and facilitate the opening of the Rafah crossing from southern Gaza into Egypt. Uh, now, that's not been open uh, yet, and these are incredibly difficult conversations, very sensitive conversations, but we are seeking to do that to provide some kind of support to those, um, uh, whether they be British nationals who are seeking to leave Gaza, and we're looking to facilitate that, or uh, humanitarian support for the people of Gaza. It is very, very difficult, and at the moment we have not been successful in getting the Rafa crossing opened. Foreign Secretary, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, do let us know what you think of the developing situation this morning. Contact us by emailing coonsberg at bbc.co.uk or on socials, use the hashtag BBC Laura Kay and we'll try and share some of the conversation a little later in the show. And if you want to read the headlines as the programme unfolds, just go to the live page, the BBC live page. The address is there for you right now. Now, Labour's leadership has been unequivocal in its support for Israel, saying the country has every right to defend itself. There have been dissenting voices in the party. David Lammy, the shadow foreign secretary, is here this morning. Good morning to you. Good morning. Um, Labour leadership has said Israel has a right to defend itself. Hamas bears responsibility for the terrorist acts. I want to ask you if you support the order from the Israeli government to those people in northern Gaza to get out and go south. This story begins last Saturday. I'm thinking of... Celine ben Nagar, a young woman finishing maternity leave, should be starting work today, and she's been taken hostage, and her baby and her husband are still in Israel. And the 1,300 people that have been murdered by a prescribed terrorist organisation. So, of course, Israel has the right to deal with that terrorism, to go and get those hostages, and to degrade the rockets and military equipment that's being used against them. So you support however, the order? However, it is hugely important that that is within international law. Victoria... Well, I've already just given some quotes to the Foreign Secretary which suggest the order to move people is against international law because it's the forcible transfer of a population. There are two things that arise from the Second World War. The first is the birth of Israel and the home for the Jewish people. And that is why it is hugely important that we support Israel's right to defend itself. The second thing is the rules-based order that we all live by. It's why we stand up to Putin and autocrats and dictators across the world. And it's hugely important that that law 
that arises from the experience of the Second World War and the Holocaust is upheld. That is so, why so, so civilian what? casualties must be minimised in any war context. Do you support the and order to move people from north to south? To food, to medicine and to utility and safe passage so they can move across the country. OK. Do you support the order to move them or not? The order to move them? Well, yeah. clearly. Just yes it, or no? It's not a yes or no, Victoria. I'm, I'm hoping one day to be Foreign Secretary and a, and a Chief Diplomat, so it's not a yes or no. Why not? Let me, Why let not? Me, can I answer the question? Please. Very simply. This is a war situation. War is ugly. Yes. Very, very sadly, people die. We have rules, and those rules mean that you must minimise death. Now, you know, and I know, because Netanyahu has said that there will be an invasion shortly against that backdrop. Of course it's right that civilians must not be in harm's way, and an order has been issued. Okay. I'm glad that that order has been extended. Of course I am. But, this, but what I, the point I want to get across is that it's hugely important that we minimise the loss of human life. Right. And anyone well, let, let, seeing those about, scenes from Gaza, it's law. horrendous for those people that are facing that at this point in time. The UN Human Rights Commissioner says the imposition of sieges that endanger the lives of civilians is prohibited under international humanitarian law. Keir Starmer, your leader, a human rights lawyer, says Israel does have the right to impose a siege. Who is right? In situations of war, where there are allegations of war crimes, that must ultimately be a matter for the UN and its agencies no. and for the ICC. No. I'm sorry, Victoria, that is the case. This is not a moment no, not for me to pass judgment we're about not, whether we're I'm not, not here as a lawyer. War crimes. And nor was the UN Secretary. Human Rights Commissioner. He was saying it's breaking international law and to he's impose entitled a siege. To his view. It's not a, it's he's not a view. To his view. It's not just plucked an opinion out of the air. He's looking at the framework, the Geneva Conventions. He says the imposition of sieges, which endangers the lives of civilians, is prohibited under international humanitarian law. Keir Starmer says Israel has a right to impose a siege. I don't. Who is right? Keir Starmer has said right from the beginning that any war. It's important that democracies uphold the rules-based order and that that must be within international law. And He's I'm said simply that asking from the beginning. You. Yep, his yep, statement and I'm, today, I'm simply his asking statement you today if says the that people should have access. Law. And I have said to you, Victoria, I'm not here as an international lawyer. That is a determination of the UN and its agencies and the ICC. It's not a determination for okay. me. But of course I hear what people are saying and their concerns about civilian casualties in Gaza. But I want to assert this, and it's hugely important, because I spoke to Yar Lapid yesterday, the former Prime Minister of Israel. He wanted to make the point to me and asked me to make this point on the show that, of course, we also know that Hamas use people as, uh, as, 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 as shelter, as human yes. shields in this context. And that is an important context to bear in mind. Sure. Uh, the Labour leadership sent out an email yesterday to MPs and councillors strongly advising them not to attend protests this weekend. Why? Lots of members of parliament are receiving messages from their constituents. In my constituency, I have the historic Stamford Hill area, uh, a natural home of the Jewish people over the last century. And lots of MPs have those pressures. It's mm. important that as we face and want to be the next government, that people do not share platforms with people who do not share Labour values, that they're careful and cautious. And we've seen uh, Labour members of Parliament exercise that caution over the last few days, and I think that must be right. So are you saying, because again, I want to be clear, if you're a Labour MP or Labour councillor, you shouldn't go, for example, to a pro-Palestinian rally? If you're a Labour MP, you should always be careful whom you share platforms with at this moment, and you should be very careful that you do nothing to drive division in our communities. Okay. There's a rise in anti-Semitism, there's a rise in Islamophobia in our country as I speak. And are you and saying as an MP, and just so in a clear, position of responsibility, yeah. you do everything to minimize, minimize those who would sow division. And are you saying they can't go to a pro-Israel rally? Guidance has gone out. It's very clear what that guidance is. 
people have a right to protest in our country. It's a right we defend because we're a democracy, just as we defend the rule of law and international law. So people have the right to protest. Okay. But we as leaders in our community should be very judicious and careful, I think, at this time. That's the right thing to do, and it's particularly the right thing to do if you hope one day to be the government. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank, Thank you. you, Shadow Foreign Secretary David Lammy. In Aberdeen, the SNP conference starts today and it could be a tricky one for the party leader and Scotland's First Minister, Humza Yousaf. Since he took over in March from Nicola Sturgeon, he has seen his predecessor arrested as part of an investigation into party finances and, of course, released. And he's seen a defeat to Labour in the Rutherglen and Hamilton West by-election and the defection to the Conservatives of SNP MP Lisa Cameron. On top of all that, his own family is caught up in the Israel-Hamas conflict. His mother-in-law, Elizabeth L. Nekla, a former nurse from Dundee, and her husband, Maged, had travelled to the south of Gaza to see a sick relative. They are now trapped in the war zone around 10 miles southwest of Gaza City. My thought is, all these people in the hospital cannot be evacuated. Where's humanity? Where's people's hearts in the world to let this happen at this day and age? We can talk now to uh, Hamza Yousaf. Good morning to you. Good morning. Thank you very much for being with us. I wonder if I could ask you, first of all, if you're able to tell us the latest about your in-laws. Last night was a very difficult night, if I'm honest. Uh, Victoria, we got a call at one in the morning from my mother-in-law uh, in a panic. Um, and she was in, on the street with uh, all of her family. And I think there had been a, a false alarm, as it turned out, but somebody next door in the neighbourhood uh, was told, they believed was told to evacuate because the house was going to get hit. So everybody in that neighbourhood, at what would have been three in the morning in Gaza, was running to goodness and God knows where because nowhere seems safe in Gaza uh, at all. Now, it ended up being a false alarm, but you can imagine the panic. And, and my mother-in-law was uh, even saying her goodbyes, which was really hard to hear. Um, now, it turned out to be a false alarm, which I'm, I'm pleased about. They're safe for now, still trapped in Gaza, so only as safe as you can be in the midst of a war zone. And that's why I go back to the point I've been making this entire week, that there has to be an immediate ceasefire. Civilians are dying. There has to be a humanitarian corridor that allows supplies in and allows innocent people to leave. This is not a, this is not a, 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 a void. This is, this is entirely avoidable. This is not a natural disaster. This is a man-made humanitarian catastrophe that's taking place. It can be and should be stopped. Do you have any confidence, any faith that that will happen? Do you think they and others will get out? It has to happen. And, you know, I pray with every fibre of my being that not just my mother-in-law and father-in-law, there are two people, there's 2.2 million Gazans. The vast, overwhelming majority have nothing to do with Hamas. Uh, could not be further away from the barbaric actions uh, of Hamas. But they are suffering. They are being collectively punished. And that cannot be justified. So we need a humanitarian corridor opened now, today, and we need to allow innocent men, women and children to be able to leave. You have said that Israel has the right to defend itself, to protect itself from terror. You've also said Israel is going too far in its military actions in Gaza. What action do you think they should be taking? Look, again, I'm, I'm not a military strategist. Uh, we all accept, I think anybody who's reasonably minded would accept that after the barbaric terrorism we saw a week past Saturday, that of course uh, Israel has a right to protect itself. Uh, but that cannot come, cannot come at the price of 2.2 million innocent men, women and children. It cannot justify cutting off water, food, fuel, supplies. I spoke to my, my mother-in-law uh, yesterday, the whole day, she hadn't eaten, or she had one egg, I think she told me. She'd had virtually just a couple of sips of water because they have dozens of people now in their house and they have little drinking water. And if that is true of my uh, in-laws, who by gas and standards have uh, money, then uh, what on earth is the plight 
for those uh, who, who are suffering the greatest. So, uh, look, I, I know there'll be a lot of discussion, quite rightly so, around the geopolitics, around the military strategy. But let's just think of the humanity here of 2.2 million people, innocent men, women and children, who are suffering. And even if my in-laws get out, which I pray to God that they do, that is just two people. What about the rest? And the world is watching. And we cannot stand idly by and allow people's lives to be lost, their homes to be destroyed, their hospitals to be bombed. We cannot allow any of these actions to take place uh, because uh, of the disgraceful actions uh, of a few which I condemn unequivocally. Do you think the UK should set up a system for Palestinians and Israelis to come to the, this country if they wish to? Yes, absolutely. And there are many people, and particularly our Jewish community, and I spent some time with uh, Scotland's Jewish community uh, on Thursday. There's many people who are worried about their relatives, Jewish, Muslim, Christian, atheist, agnostic, whether it's those that are captive and captured by Hamas or whether it's those like my own family uh, in Gaza. That's why a humanitarian corridor needs to open up. That's why there has to be a ceasefire. And we have to, uh, of course, bring people to the UK that we're able to. But also, if we want to stop this perpetual cycle of violence that you will have reported on for years and years that we see flare up, and this seems certainly like one of the worst, if not the worst, then we have to also address the root cause. And we have to say unequivocally, and there should be no controversy about this statement, that uh, an Israeli life and a Palestinian life are equal. And we have to make sure that we never lose sight of that fact. Uh, before we talk about um, SNP policies with you in a moment, just ahead of your conference, I just wanted to know, have you received help from the British Foreign Office in terms of your in-laws? I spoke to James cleverly a couple of days ago, and I know the FCDO are working hard on the ground there. They are, of course, limited in, in, in what they can do. What I appeal to James cleverly uh, to, to do and to say is to be unequivocal. Look, the UK government are a trusted ally of Israel. They should use that trusted position to be, as I say, explicit, unequivocal, and say a humanitarian corridor to allow supplies to come in and to allow people to leave must open. The border okay. Rafa crossing must open. And there has to be a ceasefire because you can have an open border, but if people can't travel there because they're worried about getting hit by a missile or rocket or Hamas gunfire, then they're not going to take the risk to travel. Okay. Uh, or they may, and may get killed en route. So the UK government has to do more. I spoke to, as well as the Jewish community on Thursday, I spoke to Palestinian leaders on Friday, and they told me they didn't feel like uh, that the, the Palestinian lives mattered. And of course, as I said already, we have to be unequivocal. Uh, we we okay. of course condemn uh, the actions of uh, Hamas. Let us say unequivocally that the life of an Israeli uh, is equal to the life of a Palestinian and vice versa. Let's turn to domestic policies, if we may. Uh, it was not that long ago that your party was hammered by Labour in the uh, Rutherglen by-election. There are a lot of other former Labour seats that polls show could be won back by Labour after a, you know, a decade of SNP dominance, if you like. Why shouldn't those voters go over to Labour? Very simply, that the suffering that many people are having to live with in Scotland day in and day out is caused by Westminster. Let's look at the, uh, not the number one issue that not, comes not up your government. every doorstep. Uh, no, the cost of living crisis is a Westminster cost of life and living crisis. It was the Conservative government. It was Westminster, of course, that torpedoed the economy last year. It is a Westminster government that has imposed over a decade, almost a decade and a half of austerity. It's a Westminster government that drags Scotland out of the European Union, which has caused economic catastrophe against the will of the Scottish people. So actually in an election that will be categorised yeah. all about change, true change doesn't come from going from Westminster blue to Westminster red. 
true change comes with independence, with taking decisions. But, but for before, before we get to independence, saying, which I am going to ask you about, just, just, just to be clear, you run public services, you can raise taxes, lower taxes. There are levers you can pull in Scotland. There are limited levers, hence why we have the most progressive tax system, hence why independent figures show that because of the actions that the Scottish Government is taking, they were estimated to lift 90,000 90, children out of poverty. Because of the levers that we have, more young people from deprived backgrounds will be going to university. So yes, we'll do what we can, but I didn't get into politics to mitigate got into politics to transform lives. Okay. And we have to well, do that. Let, let's talk in the about independence then. Because of a UK Tory government that has imposed austerity for 13 years, dragged Scotland out of the European Union against its will, and completely tanked the economy last okay. year. Okay. So, uh, the other thing that's been grabbing attention at your conference is the new policy on independence. We don't have a massive amount of time. I know you'll understand the reasons why, but I wonder if you could try and explain it for our viewers across the country. Well, first of all, your viewers should know that the SNP has had mandate after mandate to hold a referendum, a second referendum on Scottish independence, particularly after What's the new Brexit. policy? Uh, that is being denied to us. That is being denied to us uh, by the Westminster government. So the policy I'm proposing is that the next test of the proposition will be in a general election. And a general election, the rules are the seat that wins a majority of seats, of course, ends up winning that uh, general election. So because we that propose is different. to put that front and centre in our manifesto. Forgive me, Mr Yusuf, that, that is different what you said in your leadership campaign at the beginning of the year. You said independence needed to have a sustained majority support before it could yes, happen. It does. Yes, it does. But, you, but now you're uh, saying yes, you, you uh, could win the most... No, no, and, but and now, way, you're, now uh, you're saying, no, no, just so uh, I'm clear, uh, you no, could no, win I'll, the most no, seats in a general I'll election with way less than that. Uh, no, I'll address it. Trust me, if you want to test... The proposition of independence for popular support, i.e. 50% plus one, which is what I want to do, you do that through a referendum. Every democratic country in the world, if you want to test a proposition for popular support, does it by a referendum. If the UK government wants to do that, I'll hold the referendum tomorrow. Right. Because it is so the I don't, So I don't understand how your, 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 your new policy the then... People. I don't, I don't understand how the new policy well, you didn't then... Well, you didn't let me finish it. That, that, that's probably why, uh, because you didn't let me finish it. So what I said is, of course, we'll test the proposition in a general election. Now, if we win that general election, mm. and that means if we win the majority of seats, that gives us a mandate to begin negotiations with the UK government of how to give that democratic effect. Now, that could be a referendum. That could be the transfer of legal power so that we can choose when to hold a referendum. So it could be through a number of means and methods. Okay, my but point just, is just and my, and my point is, if I may, element of it. a majority of seats point, may not be 50% plus one. That's my point. You can win the majority of seats with, you know, a much lower share of the vote <laughs> than that. Uh, Victoria, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm saying to you, if Westminster parties want to test a proposition for 50% plus one, I'm happy to do that. That has to be through a referendum. Every single democratic country uses a referendum to test propositions for popular support. Okay. We want a referendum. We've demanded a referendum. We've been elected on a mandate for a referendum. If you want one, bring it on. We'll do it tomorrow. And I guarantee you, independence will be here sooner rather than later. Uh, let me ask you what you think of this word cloud. We've, we've put this to all the leaders through their conferences in the past few weeks. Um, more in common asked voters in Scotland what they thought you stood for. And as you can see, SNP, independence, Scotland, and in smaller letters underneath, useless. But then there's also fairness as well. How do you respond to that, Mr Yousaf? Well, look, when it comes to word clouds and politicians, I don't think we tend to favour favor particularly well across political parties. But look, people get our core message is about independence, is about fairness, which I think is really positive. I saw the words equality in there. But I'm not pretending to you that things are entirely rosy, uh, Victoria. They clearly aren't. There's been six months of a really difficult time for my political party. My focus, my laser light focus, is on making sure we deliver on the priorities of the people. Cost of living crisis, uh, of course, investing in public services, our NHS in particular, and of course, making sure that we grow our economy and independence linked to every single one of those priorities. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Humza Yousaf, talking to us in Aberdeen. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, right, let's talk to our panel now. Uh, thank you so much for your patience. I really, really appreciate it. Um, Sir Malcolm Rifkin, first of all, we've heard from the uh, spokesman for the Israeli government, we've heard from the British Foreign Secretary, the Shadow Foreign Secretary. I just, I just want to pause for a moment, though, and ask you how you reflect on the scale of the atrocities that we saw just over a week ago yes. and where we are now 
on the brink of a land, sea and air assault from Israel into Gaza. I think the most disturbing thing about what has happened was the Hamas decision essentially to follow ISIS, not simply to go for military targets in Israel or fight the Israeli government, but to quite deliberately, under instructions from their command, to massacre women and children in the most brutal way. Now, the last time we saw that was when ISIS were decapitating people and so forth. And that is the most repugnant thing. And I think, you know, a lot of the discussion you've had so far uh, about whether the uh, advice to people in Gaza to go south or not is very, very confused, some of the comments that have been made. In what respect? Well, the Israeli government have no power to instruct people to go south. What it was saying was, we recommend you to go south because there's going to be a war in Gaza. You're much more likely to be killed if you remain in Gaza than however difficult and painful it is if you go south. And so there are various United Nations spokesmen to imply that the Israeli government is ordering people to go south. It, it can't enforce it. Any Gazan who wants to remain in Gaza City during this war is free to do so. I think most of them will be making up their own minds, so far as we can tell, uh, to protect their own lives. And that's the right thing for them to do. And it's what the Israeli government advised them to do. Uh, Bronwyn, the, I mean, the, the, the shock and the trauma felt by so many people, particularly in Israel, but around the world after the massacre last weekend, killing of children, the kidnapping of people, the, the killing of babies, grandparents, mums, dads. N not everyone in Gaza supports Hamas, we know. What, what would you say has the, the reaction of the Palestinians in Gaza been broadly? Well, shock, fear. I'm not going to speak for the Palestinians in, in Gaza, but we've heard already a suggestion from the Palestinian ambassador that most of them support the more moderate Fatah, not, not Hamas. That is incredibly difficult to judge at the moment. But they're now in fear, obviously, that they are going to be casualties of what this group of terrorist leaders uh, has done um, supposedly in their name, but, but really out of Hamas's own motives. And yet the people of Gaza are waiting to see what descends on them. And it, it, I, I think hearing what we've heard today, it, Israel has no good options. My concern about what Israel is, appears to be intending to do is that while it can kill the Hamas leaders um, and has much, much support around the world for trying to do that, you can't kill an idea as easily mm. and militants may just rise up again. And also that the siege, more than the direction or recommendation to leave northern Gaza, but the siege has really the potential to kill a lot of innocent Palestinian civilians. And that, to me, is the danger for Israel here. And Dali, what would, how would you respond to what Bronwyn said? Because your people are on the ground in Gaza who are trying, trying to help them, f stop them from starving. They're also in danger. What, what happened in Israel last weekend was horrifying. Uh, what's happening today in Gaza is, is just as horrifying. In both cases, it's innocent civilians who are caught um, in a cycle of violence. And my own colleagues, uh, um, those who we still have contact with, are in a desperate situation. I, I got a message from a colleague this morning who has managed to move um, south with her family. They're in a small house with 45 other people. There's no running water. They've only got bottled water. They're worried about sanitation. Um, and of course, food and energy uh, is, is running out. And so these are the most sort of horrific conditions. I and mean, that's just not sustainable for anybody. And the only Whether way you're, is... you're, you're, you're you know, ordinary Palestinian, an aid worker, whoever. And that's what, what troubles me about what we've heard even this morning is that there's, there's not enough emphasis on, on the only way to, to solve this from, to stop this from becoming a worse humanitarian catastrophe, and that's a ceasefire. We have to stop the escalation of hostilities. Um, allow unfettered humanitarian access, um, and no one seems to be prepared to talk about that. You can't have a ceasefire when the people who are responsible for these massacres wish to continue behaving like that as long as they have the power to do so. The, re the reality is if you want to stop the ghastly violence, the Hamas leadership, the military leadership, have to be destroyed, as happened with ISIS. Remember when ISIS took over northern Iraq, northern Syria? and Mosul had hundreds of thousands of civilians there, they weren't killed at the end of the day. It was the Hamas people, who were, the ISIS people who were killed. And that particular problem in Iraq and Syria was resolved. You've got to be realistic in the world we live in. I think ceasefire is the wrong word uh, for some of the reasons that Malcolm Rifkin has just said. But the humanitarian problem is separate. The desperate need of people now in southern Gaza 
for food, water, sanitation. That is a separate question. And I think only by getting into the regional talks that are beginning informally around the corner about what to do about Israel's hostages, whether they can be extracted from, from Hamas. But it, you know, this is an extraordinarily difficult position. To, I entirely agree, you can't really negotiate with people who are capable of this kind of brutality, but can you save some of the others? I have two concerns here. One is that cutting off of electricity and water to the population uh, is cruel. Uh, I think it's a, it's a crime against humanity. Un unnecessary innocent lives are going to be lost or already being lost. My other concern, I was in Gaza only a few months ago, is in that tiny plot of land where it's so densely populated, I, ca I just can't uh, imagine a situation in which any further escalation of hostilities is not going to result in innumerable lives lost. You know, several of my own colleagues are staying in the north of Gaza because they can't leave. They've got disabled family members. They don't have fuel for their cars to leave. And they're caught amongst, you know, presumably hundreds of thousands of others who are going to be left in the middle of what is going to become. But, but Danny, are you agreed that it is safer for the people of Gaza who live in Gaza City to move south on their own initiative, even yeah, though they've been... That, 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 that is safer, Malcolm, it? Malcolm, that is the easier point. The, quite, the more difficult point for Israel as well is what to do about the humanitarian aid to save yes, or protect those yes, who are now in southern Gaza. Right. I, I think that is a very real issue, and I, I go along with what you say on that, with one qualification. The Israeli government have said <coughs> they will resume the humanitarian aid, not the humanitarian aid, the electricity and the other supplies. <coughs> Uh, if Hamas released the hostages. Now, Hamas could do that right now if they had any interest in the welfare of their fellow Palestinians. They could say, yes, we will release these 150 hostages, and Israel has said we will then stop the boycott. And let's Very assume, simple, if and, they are willing to do it. And if they aren't willing to do it, if they have no concern for the people of Gaza, then the people of Gaza will suffer. Well, the people of Gaza are suffering at the moment. They are suffering because they are caught up, as the people in Iraq were, when ISIS took over control of them, and then c uh, committed terrorism against innocent people as a deliberate act of policy. Nobody seriously believes the Israeli government deliberately want to target civilians. Civilians, as you know, more mm. as well as I do, civilians get caught up in wars. And the question is, do the Israeli government have a realistic alternative? Is there an alternative, given the way Hamas have behaved, than to eradicate the Hamas military wing and certainly people will die in that, as they've done, they did in the Second World War, well, they've Roman done in every that. war. Is there an alternative? Happened. Dying just as a result of that military action is different from people dying from lack of food and water. Yes. Um, and that is, it seems to me, the most difficult and question facing Israel at the moment. Yes, you're quite right. It's difficult to get food and, and water into a war situation. But Hamas could themselves, at this very moment, ease that situation dramatically by releasing the hostages. The Israeli government have said they will respond if that happens. And if it doesn't happen, ha Israel still has the question of whether to allow humanitarian aid in, in from the south. Well, I hope they feel able to do so. But, you know, that's not the central point, to be perfectly honest. The central point Danny? is to get this war completed as quickly as possible with the minimum civilian casualties. Let the Israeli go government have no self-interest in coming to any different objective than saving as many civilians who are not responsible for the atrocities. Okay. But at what cost? I think that's the, that's the challenge that all of us have to be asking. What's your alternative? Well, the alternative would be uh, to, put all, to force all parties to de-escalate. How do you force them except by military means, given the way Hamas has behaved? Well, at, at the very least, protect the lives in, of innocent situations. Which you can well. only do by having military people to protect them. No, you can turn back on the electricity and, the, and, and allow fuel back into Which they are willing to do if the hostages are released. So Simple as that. Why don't you blame Hamas and say, if only they would Every, release the every, everyone once, blames, that problem would be resolved? Everyone what? blames Hamas, but if Hamas won't do that, the prospect is that many, many innocent civilians will, yes. will, We're gonna, will, will die. You're thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to pause there. Thank you. Uh, thank you to our panel. That is it for today. For more, do join myself and Paddy O'Connell for the weekend newscast. We'll be recording straight after the programme and it'll be on BBC Sounds a little later. That's it from us. Have a good day.